The F-35 is the most technologically advanced fighter jet ever made. What you're looking at is practically a flying supercomputer. And we're living in a time when computers can send humans to the International Space Station, dock autonomously, with the rocket landing on a drone ship. Maybe that's why Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla, thinks that pilots' days might be numbered. The fighter jet era has passed. Pilots used to fly aircraft by moving a control, which moved a cable, which moved a flap. It was physical input and physical output, with nothing electronic in between. It used to be that aircraft were hard to fly, requiring stick and rudder aptitude, while also having the brain capacity to perform in a battle. But it hasn't been that way for decades. Computers are integral to flying. And a couple of months ago, Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla, told a room packed with fighter pilots that the fighter jet era had passed. Lo locally autonomous do uh, drone warfare is where it's at, where the future will be. Now, I'm, I'm just saying, it's not, I want the future to be this, it's just, this is what the future will be, okay. is autonomous drone warfare. Um, the fighter jet era has passed. That is, it's just, yeah, fighter jet era has passed. Okay. So it's, it's drones. Um, let's go back to failure for a minute and Computers haven't always gone hand in hand with aircraft. It started with fly-by-wire systems in the 60s and 70s. Fly-by-wire is what replaced the conventional manual flight controls. Instead, aircraft would have an electronic interface. The pilot's inputs are converted to electronic signals and then transmitted by wires, hence the name. Fully fly-by-wire systems interpret the pilot's control inputs as a desired outcome and calculate the control surface positions required to make it happen. It means that a simple control input might result in various combinations of rudder, elevator, aileron, flaps, and engine controls all at once. The pilot might not even be aware of all the control outputs, only that the aircraft is doing what they told it to. The computer system can also manage things automatically, such as stabilizing the aircraft. In fact, since fly-by-wire was invented, aircraft designs have been made possible that otherwise would have been unable to fly, like the F-117 Nighthawk or the B-2 Bomber. What we need is machines to do what they can do, and then we do the, the more interpretive, the more decision-making. So if the machines provide the information, then it's actually us making those decisions from that information. So it's understanding what that information looked like. Again, less of the spanner turning and more of the actual decision making. So when did all this start? In the 60s, engineers were designing the first fly-by-wire machine out of necessity. And ironically, it wasn't for use in the air, but in space. The first pure electronic fly-by-wire aircraft with no mechanical or hydraulic backup was the Apollo Lunar Landing Training Vehicle. It was built to mimic the controls of the Apollo mission's lunar module. So let's talk about that Apollo computer then. One of the most influential aspects of the Apollo missions was its guidance system. At the time, the Apollo computers were state-of-the-art. Much smaller than the computers of the time, their memory was hand-woven, taking months to produce, and any errors in the programming would literally be woven into the system. Without the computers flying the rocket and modules, the Apollo missions wouldn't have been successful. And it was all made possible with computers millions of times slower than your smartphone.
40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward to the On back light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The Apollo computers are credited with kick-starting the Silicon Valley industry, and 10 years later, personal computers were on the market. It also wasn't long before NASA was trying their fly-by-wire system on an F-8, and then similar systems began to pop up in aviation around the world. The first production fly-by-wire airliner was the Concorde. Then, in 1984, the Airbus A320 became the first airliner to fly an all-digital fly-by-wire control system, becoming the first commercial airliner to feature a full glass cockpit. Computers were revolutionising the aerospace industry. Before long, fly-by-wire was being implemented in almost all aircraft. What started with the space race was now found in passenger aircraft and fighters alike. It took the limitations of how we built aircraft how we uh, made the aircraft feel, it took that all away and allowed us to tailor, to fit an airplane and how it flies for the human that was going to be in the cockpit. And we started to ask the aircraft to do a lot more. And we have matured it so well that we have aircraft now, fourth generation aircraft that are remarkably easy to fly. I was one of the early Eurofighter test pilots as a German civilian and Typhoon is like I used to say it's like driving a Bentley. It is so fabulous, the feel of that aircraft. That's what fly-by-wire fly brought to us. We don't even talk about it anymore. Look, an F-35, you basically can never put the aircraft out of control. And if you manage to get it so it didn't want to fly, it'll immediately understand that and, and get itself righted and take you back flying. It's almost the simplest aircraft to fly that I've ever been in. As time has gone on and those computers have become more advanced, pilots have begun to seem less important. War can now be waged from hundreds of miles away from the safety of a container where pilots control drones. With the F-35's computers, it goes much further than helping a pilot fly. In a fourth generation aircraft, the pilot was asked to play multiple video games to manage all the information on different screens and he or she was the central figure understanding everything that was sent to him. And if he or she managed all that information well, they could complete the task. But at some point, there's so much happening in the dynamics of a combat environment that the man or woman fails to understand everything that's being sent to them and likely fails to do their job as best they can. That they get overloaded you know, in workload. And sensor fusion changed that. They see the entire battle space. They know when to attack and when to skirt a, a skirmish, when to avoid contact with the enemy, how to quarterback because you see everything, how to quarterback. And when we really want to see the potential of the F-35, we put it in large force exercises, simulating big wars. And then you get to see how powerful the F-35 information is amongst the people that fly it and then passing on that information to keep our fourth generation brethren alive because we pass on the information of where the, the bad guys, where the threats are. What's really interesting is talking about the fifth generation pilot, the young men and women that had never touched a fighter jet until they came to the F-35. Their baseline, everything they know is a of what airplanes do is nine million lines of code. It's the Tony Stark helmet 
that I love talking about, like Avengers, the Avengers movie uh, shows. It's living in a world where everything you do is stealth tactics. It's living in an aircraft that's a strategic asset, not a tactical, tactical fighter, like everything that was known before. It's the way they think and adapt to all that information every single day. The transition for an older generation pilot to living in this new world is a difficult, difficult task, but it's fascinating to watch a young generation that knows nothing else. They are the most powerful part of F-35, more powerful than the, the aircraft itself, because they are the men and women that will act, actually maximize the potential of what this weapon system is all about. The power of its systems puts the F-35 ahead in combat. But how long until the person in the cockpit is made redundant? Or worse yet, holds back the machine? Is this the beginning of the end for the fighter pilot? I'm a true believer that there has to be a human in the cockpit. I'm a true believer based on my combat experience, myself in a fighter jet, dropping lethal ordnance over Kosovo and Serbia 20 years ago, and as the commander of my force, the Canadian force, where I was obligated to watch every single weapon delivery, delivered by a Canadian pilot in combat, I'm a true believer there has to be a human in the cockpit to make those life or death decisions exactly at the second where it has to be made. And I don't believe you can subjugate that to a, a trailer thousands of miles away or to allow it to happen autonomously. There is zero appetite, zero tolerance for the collateral damage potential that has happened throughout all the many generations of war. Indiscriminate use of lethal power, just it doesn't fit in any of our societies in the Western world anymore. And based on my personal experience, I can't imagine us ready to offer that up to anything autonomous in my lifetime. Elon Musk says that the fighter jet era is over. But ask a fighter pilot and they'll disagree. But even if the F-35 isn't the last manned fighter, it is a step in a different direction. Perhaps in the future, manned aircraft will work alongside drones, commanding the battle. Maybe pilots will even carry autonomous drones with them as weapons. One thing's for sure though, if there are pilots in sixth generation jet fighters, their jobs are going to be very different. Thanks again for watching. Please subscribe and drop me a like. And let me know in the comments, what do you think the future of fighter pilots looks like?